Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Digital North American FPNA board. Today we'll talk about the art and science of digitized FPNA business partnering. My name is Hans Gobin. I am an international FPNA board and FPNA trends ambassador, and today I'll facilitate this meeting for you guys. Uh, just to let you know that we have over 400 people joining us today from 27 countries. Uh, so we're looking forward to a great meeting today. So moving on to my next slide, just quickly share with you what the agenda is for today. So we'll talk about the new journey for FPNA, the skills and processes, FPNA business partnering. So what is that model and how mature is your model? A journey towards integrated FPNA business partnering. Technology to build FPNA business partnering, very important. Of course, we're talking about digitized FPNA here. Um, and finally, we'll, uh, we'll go and talk about getting future ready for digitized FPNA business partnering. Much more around mindset there. We've got conclusions and recommendation. And then finally, we'll end the session with a Q&A. It is now a good time to, for me to just share with you uh, what have been the discussions point in North America. Please go through it. Um, I will not go through each one uh, on this slide. It is now a great time for me to share with you and introduce our speakers, um, especially um, on the panel today, which we've got five. So at this point, I would like to ask the panelists to join me with their webcam. Um, and I will start introducing them one by one. So first I have Xu Zhang. Xu Zhang is Vice President Finance at Curriculum Associates. Of course, she leads team to serve as strategic partners to the exec team, which is where the business partnering element comes in and driving and helping driving company grow and scaling the multi product service model. Shu, it is great to have you with us today. Very glad to be here, and I look forward to sharing and learning with all the finance friends here. Thank you very much, Shu. Our next member of the panel is Anthony Rosano, who's director of FPNA at Indeed.com, which we all know. Of course, he leads a very strong um, team of FPNA professionals, promoting collaborative environment, driving continuous learning and development. Um, Anthony brought his passion for analysis to a number of global and high-tech companies to partner closely with business leaders on driving growth again and providing decision support. Anthony, it's great to have you with us. Great to be here, Hans. Anthony, thank you very much. Our next speaker for today is uh, George Colocotronis, who is Div Divisional Finance Director at Medio which is a digital health business unit of Hypertech Group. Again, George has lots of experience having developed strong business acumen working in different industries and in different companies. Once again, George's passion includes successfully mapping and executing organizational FPNA transformation and working closely with talent to help develop the required skill set. Uh, George joins us today from uh, Canada, Montreal in Canada, uh, and will talk to us about the journey towards integrated FPNA business partnering. George, great to have you with us. Pleasure to be here, Hans. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. I just missed mentioning that Anthony was from New York and Shu was from um, Boston. So, moving on. We've got Pras Chatterjee, who's Senior Director of Product and Marketing for Planning and Analysis at SAP, of course, focusing on SAP Analytics, uh, Cloud and SAP BBC, BPC. Uh, also served as Solution Architect for SAP, focusing on planning and consolidation. Uh, Pras is also a, a Chartered Professional Accountant uh, and has pre presented with us in previous occasion. Uh, Pras will Talk to us about technology today and how to build that FPNA business partnering model using technology. Pras, great to have you with us today. Thanks, Hans. I'm happy to be here and looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you. And finally, we have Tom Hood. Tom Hood is currently Vice President 
uh, Executive Vice President of Business Engagement and Growth for ACI, PA and SEMA. Uh, Tom, you've got a, a, a great accolades there, but of course you're one of the most, second most influential person in accounting by Accounting Today magazine with over 750,000 followers. But much more importantly, the work you've been doing uh, with AICP and SEMA, which is uh, great. And of course, former CFO as well. Uh, Tom, great to have you on the panel today. Thank you very much for being with us. Hans, I'm looking forward to a, a great discussion. Thank you. Guys, we've got a great panel of uh, members today and they, we've got great presentation and insight coming from these guys shortly after a few slides that I've got to cover. So guys, if you may switch your uh, webcam off and go on mute, um, I've got a few more slides and then we will move on to the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so quick one there, um, just quickly on FPNA Trends Group, um, just highlighting there the eight chap chapters of the North America board uh, we're bringing together today. Uh, also worth mentioning best practice workshops and consultancy that we have recently started on demand from our members. Um, very important for me to let you know that it is a 90 minutes webinar. We've got four great polling questions. We would like to hear uh, your view and what you're doing within your own organization via the polling questions. So please vote. Uh, please ask questions via the chat box. You can ask questions now all the way through, even during Q&A sessions. We will answer some of them today the others we will answer to you via email. Uh, you can network with us directly via LinkedIn. The presentations are also available in handouts for you to download, or you will receive a copy of the recording and a copy of the presentation within a couple of days after this meeting. Finally, very important for us is when I close the session, you will get a feedback pop-up form. Please give us your feedback. We'd like to hear from you on what we can improve, but more importantly, what else would you like to hear about in the future? Uh, a big thank you to our technology partner, which is SAP. Of course, we all know SAP, one of the world's leading providers of modern FPNA solution. And also today, we've got our information partner, which is Business Learning Institute, uh, AICPA and SEMA. And again, you know, helping us in the VUCA world so that organizations and communications uh, communities can strive. A uh, quick couple of slides from me, just putting or setting the scene. Um, FBNA business partnering has changed massively over the last five, 10 years. You know, a lot of collaboration is required, education, motivation, challenging, analytical, so a mix of soft and technical skills. Um, of course, we'll talk today about integrated strategic business operational plan. Also, the XPNA, which is extended planning and analysis uh, element of things. But I think much more um, to the tune of today, we'll be talking about how we can bring all of that together through digitization. Final slide from me for today here is let's talk about quickly share with you the FPNA business partnering maturity model. You've seen this before. If you haven't, there's three state basic developing leading stage. And this model has been developed by our 27 FPNA board around the world. And on the left hand, you'll see all the different um, aspects so on approach, on business knowledge, on degree of influence, on soft skills, on analytics and on technology. Where do we think our company is and what can we do to move to the next stage? Just to highlight here in that red box on the um, far right is the leading stage. So collaborative approach is required. Strong holistic knowledge in terms of business acumen. XPNA uh, has to be adopted. We have to be key influencers and trusted advisors, confident in challenging. In terms of analytic integrated driver-based model, real-time scenario planning, integrated analytic platforms, prescriptive and predictive analytics using AI capabilities. Our presenters will talk to us about this in much more details in our next few slides. So I'll leave it here. Please uh, think about it. We've got a polling questions that we'll be asking uh, to you next. 
But our next um, or first presentation today, uh, we will talk about the new journey for FPNA skills and processes. And to talk to us about that, we have Xu Jiang, who is VP Finance at Curriculum Associate. Xu, great to have you on the panel. Over to you whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Hi, everyone. Very, very glad to be here to share and discuss FPNA business partnering. Um, you know, when we talk about FPNA, there are several phrases that we can describe how FPNA played traditionally within the organization. So we are uh, business partners, we are financial advisor, we can be the inside teller, and um, a lot of other words that describe the roles within of FPNA. So I believe most people agree that the world has been changing dramatically the past year. You know, pandemic, working from home. And for myself, I have never been working from home so long. So, um, so today I want to discuss that how FPNA carries the roles in a post-pandemic environment and what are the new skills or process that we need to fit in this environment. In my following slides, I'm going to look at what we're used to. So on the left side, I believe um, there's no surprise for everyone. Very traditional way for FPNA, trend analysis, variance analysis, the annual budget and seasonal forecasting. However, you know, a lot of people might recall that what happened to the finance team last year when the pandemic hit us. Um, the constant need to run scenarios, we need to be able to quickly action and understand the actionable insights. We need to be flexible planning for different kinds of contingencies. We all work remotely. We rethink the data sources and strategies to build the business performance. These are all the new needs that are challenging the traditional views of, of FPNA. So lots of people rethink about how FPNA can move from the left side to the right side. What is the skill set? What is the skill set and the process change? What are the tools that we will need to make it happen? So in my following slides, I'm going to discuss how we execute the changes at Curriculum Associate. So I joined the company during the pandemic. And I met my entire team online, met my business partners, built my connections, the relationship with this company all virtually. So it was a really fun experience to join the team and execute the changes while all working remotely. And today I want to share, you know, how we, we did it. We made it happen. So when we talk about the business partnering, I believe a lot of people agreed, you know, we're not a finance reporter that putting together the reports. Um, and when we tell the insights, you know, we're not the people who tell the business is, oh, today is raining or today is sunny. We want to be the real business partner to help drive, grow, and transform the business. So one of the key mindset to change here is that, you know, we're all mini CFOs for the business that we support, regardless of the title that we have today. You know, we can be a finance manager, we can be a finance director, we can be a VP, we can be a senior analyst. But the mindset here is that how I can serve the business as of that we were the CFO for the business that we support. So with this mindset, so the first step is that we introduce this balanced scorecard across all business units and functions and build the scorecard process in our business partnering process. So I believe everyone agrees there's so many KPIs within the company by different functions. But if we step back and think about the business in a consolidated view, and we can find that we can bucket all the KPIs probably into the four buckets that I show up here financials, people, customers, and products and processes. So this gave us an overview of the business, not just a piece of finance. As so many things that impact the financial performance, so it's very hard to look at only financials without looking at other things to tell what is the insights, what is the driver, what is driving the business. And this is what I mean by thinking about ourselves as the mini CFO instead of a regular, you know, like a typical FP&A roles. So as a CFO, you know, the CFO is not thinking about the financials only, but overall business from different perspective. This also provides a consistent view and visibility and transparency across all the business. And when we talk about the consistent here, so it's really hard for us to go away from the schedule, in, go away from the monthly schedule. So I'm going to talk a little more details in my following slides. So the key things for effective business partnering is quick, actionable insights and influence decision making. And we don't want the business partner with the business too late, otherwise the influence on the business will be weak or outdated. So that being said, set up the monthly calendar is very important. As you can see, we set up this monthly cadence, manage the calendar to stick to the five day close, two day scorecard, and the seven whole seven day business partner with the business. 
And the people here probably wondering why it takes seven days, why it cannot be an hour meeting to talk about the business performance. Why is seven days? This is because of the mini CFO mindset that I described in my you know, previous slides. So we're not only looking at financials, but also the overall business, including the strategies. Not only look at what has happened, but also look for future, what's going to happen and what actions the business want to take and what's the impact on overall picture. We run the scenarios, we discuss the hiring plan with different teams. So by the end of the seven days, the each business partner has a place in the business, knows what's going on, knows what's going to be happening and consolidate all the forecasts and know the following action line insights and consolidate them and report back to our leadership team and board of directors. So that's why it will take seven days to get there. And given that business partnering is so interactive, as you can imagine, into the whole process and so collaborative. So in my following slides, I will discuss what is really the new requirement for, um, for this new process. So number one is data integration. As you can see, the four buckets KPI I mentioned, lots of data there, not only financials. So the data integration is very important and can reduce our manual work and also reduce the reconciliation work. The number two is suited for the collaboration, suited for the business strategy and different kind of functions integration. So we partner with the business, we partner with our function partner, and we partner with each other in a team. So the tool want to be easy to use and self-service. And because we don't want to learn uh, get another new science degree in order to master the new tool. Um, and the tool needs to be able to scenario planning with action insights, not report whether it's raining or sunny without any insights. We want to be flexible and agile because of the constant change on the business side. So I'm really excited for the next phase of the digitalization world. So thank you for listening to my presentation today. Shu, thank you very much for a, a great presentation. And of course, you've, you've brought quite a lot of, uh, of what I've just shared around the leading stage and how the old and the new kind of come together. So thank you very much for that. I would like to invite uh, Anthony and George to join us and give us some comments. So Anthony, if I may start with yourself first, please. Sure, um, yeah, great job, Shu. Um, I think you made a, a lot of really good points, um, especially around you know, something that we could all relate to with the pandemic uh, hitting. You know, The old ways of working really were not conducive to us being strong business partners and we were forced to take action. Um, but I think going forward, those learnings and those new ways that we had to adapt are things that we can carry forward and don't need, you know, another pandemic <laughs> to uh, to still use as a, a tool set for us to partner with the business. So I think that was really great to highlight. Uh, George, over to you. Thank you. Uh, for me, FP&A transformation is causing uh, FP&A professionals to kind of reevaluate the roles within the finance function, but also across the whole organization. And I find this change in the playbook by which we work um, requires us to kind of take stock and the required skills that you need to be successful. So in Shu's presentation, uh, I really like how she's presented the evolution of what's happening right now and how continuous professional development is encompassing key FP&A events, such as uh, rolling forecasts and scenario planning. And they're all centered around this, uh, this issue of actionable insight. So I think it was very well done. George, Anthony, thank you very much for your comments. And, and Shu, thank you very much for a, a great presentation and for taking us through your, joy, your journey from old to new. Um, having heard from you now, Shu, let us hear from our panel, um, our um, attendees today on what they're doing in their organization, uh, especially to do with um, where do they think uh, they believe they are on that business partnering uh, maturity model. So guys, if you can vote, please. So do you think you are at that basic stage at the very beginning of your uh, development or developing stage in the middle or the leading stage that I described to you early on? So A or one, basic stage, two, developing stage, or three, leading stage. Where are you in that model? So guys, I'll, I'll give you another 10 seconds to vote and then I will close the voting. Um, so are we at the basic stage, the developing stage, or the leading stage? I'm now going to close uh, the polling and I will share the results with the panel. So 27, 24% say we are at the basic stage, 
67% at developing state and 9% at the leading state. If I may ask uh, uh, Shu and Anthony to join us and give us some comments on um, what we're seeing here. Shu, if I may start with you, please. Hi, um, I think the um, this is basically, you know, um, very clearly to show that we, most of the people are in a developing state. So I think the leading stake actually is the state that we're working towards on. And to get there, you know, it requires us to become a real, you know, business partner, have the CFO mindset and help drive the business, build the trust, build the relationship and feel comfortable to speak up and challenge. I think most of people are still working on the field, you know, being feeling comfortable, being feeling confident to speak up and challenge the business assumptions. So I think it's, um, I'm not very surprised on the poll results here that most of people are on a developing state, but we're working on towards the leading state. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And Anthony, your comment? Yeah, similar to Shu, um, I, I'm not too surprised by this and, and you know, I'm definitely uh, delighted to see that you know a large percentage are at, at least in the developing state. Um, I think that you know as uh, FPNA professionals, you know we're we're often just trying to continuously improve not only our partnership capabilities but the business itself. Um, so you know I'd be curious to to uh, understand if maybe certain areas are a little bit more in the leading state versus developed state um, versus basic state and, and you know, looking at, at things a little bit more individually to get an assessment of um, you know, everyone's maturity model. Um, but you know, not surprised by these results and, and glad to see. Absolutely well said, both Shu and uh, uh, Anthony there. And, and I think it, it's important to describe that, that probably some of the members that believe they are in the basic state may have one or two elements that they think they are in the developing state and vice versa. I think it's a journey and I think it, it, it puts you on that mind map to make sure, okay, so what do I do next, which is great about this. So thank you very much for your comments. Let me hide this and let us now move on to our next session, which is on FPNA business partnering. How much you, is your model? And to talk to us about that, we've got Anthony Rosano, who's director of FPNA at Indeed. Anthony, over to you whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Hans. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, business partnering and assessing how mature your model is. Uh, so to start, I wanted to um, kind of talk through a theme that you'll hear throughout uh, my presentation and probably most of the presentations today. And that theme is on evolution, um, the evolution of you know, our, our, our maturity and our state as a business partner. Um, so I thought start with a quote from the father of evolution, Charles Darwin, or a quote attributed to him. Um, and it reads, it's not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent, it's the one most adaptable to change. Um, and I think that's just the mindset that, you know, we have to go into, uh, you know, working with the business and maturing our model to be most successful with them. Um, today, I'll walk you through a framework to assess the maturity of your model, uh, some considerations to keep in mind, and also I'll talk through, um, you know, how we're using this at Indeed to assess and mature our model. Um, so on my next slide, we'll start with uh, how to assess the maturity of your model. The first thing that you need to do is you need to take stock or take inventory of all of the activities that your team is performing. Um, and I like to think of those activities being divided in three clean buckets, um, run the business, grow the business, and transform the business activities. Um, so run the business activities, this really encapsulates a lot of the backbone of finance or FP&A. These activities are things like month end close, um, variance analysis, reporting, et cetera. And as we move into that leading state and, and you know, are evolving our model, what we need to think about is you know, how much are we leaning into integrated planning, um, meaning we're not just looking at historical financials, but also incorporating non-financial metrics or other things um, you know, in our planning efforts. Um, how available is data, especially you know, in a pandemic and as the worst, uh, workforce has been more distributed, it's so important that we're able to get access to data on demand and that speaks to you know, how evolved your digital transformation is. And finally, what actions or what activities uh, could be better situated centrally 
uh, where you can employ either a center of excellence or other tools to streamline and drive efficiency. Um, so those are things you need to assess in the run the business activities and the maturity of them. Um, grow the business. This really is where most of your uh, business partnership actions and, and um, subject matter expertise actions uh, reside. Um, you know, here is where you want to really assess how you're working with the business and partnering with them um, and how evolved the, that planning is. So are you using one kind of stale uh, planning uh, scenario or are you constantly working with them through continuous efforts to both analyze and understand what is driving the business, not only to know where you're going, but also to challenge the business and see if we can continue to push for that growth uh, even stronger than they believe. Um, this allows us to be uh, at the table and to help drive decisions and that support. And finally, in transform, these are activities that are much more forward looking in nature. Uh, they require uh, strategic planning and uh, for you to invest in, in those who can you know, partner with the business in that to develop new business models and to incubate new products so that FP&A can not only take a ride with the business, but is influencing where that, that drive is going. Um, so those are, you know, the this is the framework for assessing the activities and, and how mature your um, operating model is. Um, on my next slide, I'll talk through some key things that cut across these three buckets and that are really important to consider when you're, you're thinking about how to evolve your model. First is your tech stack. Um, are you highly reliant on spreadsheets or are you, you know, employing some digi uh, visualization tools um, or AI or machine learning to help drive efficiency? Um, these are you know, key things to consider when uh, you're thinking about how to evolve your, your model. Um, skill match. It's really important that your team has the right mix of both soft and technical skills, as Han had mentioned at the beginning. Um, but also it's important that you match uh, those who lead with certain skill sets to the right areas. Um, if you have someone who's a really good storyteller, they need to be facing the business and uh, driving you know, what insights you're, you're uh, developing um, forward to, to inf influence and impact decisioning. Um, when it comes to storytelling, are you simply uh, telling the news as Shu uh, or, or talking about the weather as Shu had mentioned, or are you um, creating the news? Are you gathering those insights and driving um, impact on what decisions are being made? So it's really important to assess and to consider with how mature uh, your model is. And finally, uh, this notion of one plan, um, which this speaks to XPNA, which Pros will we'll talk about later uh, in, in our session, but how closely related is your strategic business and operational model and, and, uh, or plan and how well do they work together? Um, you know, making sure that your, your company is committed to this is really crucial in the evolution of, of uh, your maturity. Um, so, you know, those are some tools that you can use to assess and to consider how mature your model is. Um, you know, I'll talk about now what uh, Indeed, how Indeed has used these tools um, to assess that and to make some changes. Um, so first we started with this three box framework with run, grow and transform. Um, and, you know, not only did we overlay them on the activities that our teams were doing, but we, we use that as a lens to really understand that our teams are already situated and aligned to these buckets. Um, we have a corporate fp a team that is very focused on a lot of the run the business activities. We have subject matter experts that are embedded with our business partners that help them grow. And then finally, we have a team that is dedicated to, you know, what transformative efforts we're making and how we're we're evolving as a, as a company uh, in the long run. Um, when we looked at the activities though that these teams were, were doing, we realized there was an imbalance, especially in the grow the business area. Um, those teams were responsible for everything from month end close, reporting uh, and uh, working with the business and analyzing the results, driving insights. It's just too much for any one team to bear. Um, without adding, you know, a, a lot of heads. 
Um, so what we're doing now is we are investing in the run the business team to think about what um, tools can we use to you know, drive more efficiency, what processes or center of excellence can we create to hand over a lot of those duplicative tasks to this area so that we can expand the bandwidth of our existing team to really focus on analysis and insights and helping the business grow. Um, so, you know, I think that this really shows how it's an easy way to assess the maturity of your model. Um, and, you know, you can use this to, to drive impact on your teams and on the business. Um, so I hope you, you can use that uh, to your advantage. Um, thank you. And back to you, Hans. Love the way uh, you've broken it uh, at indeed into these three elements, Anthony, uh, the three pillars and, and how you've shared with us your uh, experience over the last um, slide that you've gone through. So thank you very much for that. I would like to invite um, our fellow uh, panelists, um, Shu and George, to join us and give us some comments, please. So Shu, if I can start with yourself, please. Yeah, um, so one thing I really appreciate Anthony mentioned here is about building a strong team. For example, like people are taught good at storytelling, should face the business, and people are good at, you know, running the data, maybe work for, you know, the center of excellence and run the business, while the people who is dedicated to grow the business can focus on analytics and partner with the business. Um, and then in this way, you know, everyone is not burning out and everyone has their strength, you fully utilize their strength. You know, I, 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 I cannot agree with him more than on this because, you know, team is actually one of the most important thing to me as well. Um, so having the right team and right culture um, is the key foundations for success in my mind. And in a day, you know, we're all humans and we, we cannot be perfect and we cannot be strong at every element of the IFNA world. Um, so having the strong team, it doesn't really mean that every team member needs to be strong in everything but it means that how we can have the right feed and right combination of the strength and weakness of the various team member to make the whole team strong. So that's my biggest takeaway from Anthony's um, presentation. So great job. Thank you, Shu. George? For me, uh, it, it's nice to see how Anthony put together a framework which kind of shows how organizations progress through different phases of the FP&A transformation. So as we saw from the previous poll results, Organizations today are in different degrees of completion of their FP&A transformation. So the, the model is constantly evolving and every organization is kind of trying to determine which tools to use and how to use them. So in my opinion, in, in his presentation, Anthony did a great job of kind of demonstrating how combining technology, uh, the skill set, the storytelling, and then one plan or one integrated approach, uh, especially at Indeed, uh, how those components all work together. So. Uh, it was very well done. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Shu. And Anthony, thank you very much um, for your presentation and the comments. Uh, now that we've heard from Anthony, uh, Shu and George um, quite extensively on skills, let us hear what um, our members and our uh, attendees today think on um, what skills do you think your organization need to develop for better fp &A business partnering? Uh, the first one there is it data skills is it technological skills second one third business knowledge or fourth the softer skills if you can vote please so first option is is it data skills technology is the second option business knowledge is the third and fourth is softer skills so if you can vote please i will give it another uh, 10 seconds or so um and i will close the vote now and i'm sharing the results and what the results tell us 28 percent say data skills 28 percent technological skills 33 percent business knowledge and 12 percent softer skills so the first three are, are there or thereabouts in terms of percentages uh if i can ask anthony and george to join us and uh anthony if i may start with yourself uh for some comments here please Sure. Um, so I'm actually a little surprised that uh, I thought there was going to be a clear winner. Um, so it seems pretty evident that, you know, we want to uh, develop all areas. Uh, maybe the softer skills are, are already there, but, um, you know, it makes sense that we'd want to develop technological skills, data skills, because those are really the tools that we use to 
uh, you know, uh, use those soft skills with, with our connection and partnership with the business. Um, but I also think that business knowledge definitely is, is most important and that's the way to gain trust with the business. Um, so I think all of these areas are definitely good to work on, but I'm a little surprised that there wasn't a clear uh, cut winner. Thank you. Uh, George? I'm not surprised with business knowledge, um, uh, although uh, I am a little surprised that the lead uh, was so small. Uh, in my opinion, I think business knowledge is one of those things that's critical to have. Uh, it creates credibility. Um, it, re it, it creates a sense of uh, respect in terms of the opinion and the insights and recommendations that business partners have. Um, in being able to communicate across the enterprise and being able to be heard and being influential. And I think while having solid data skills and having a fundamental understanding of technology and of course, softer skills such as presenting and communication, uh, without having a true foundational uh, understanding of the business and being able to exhibit that understanding, uh, I think the business partnering role uh, would, would, would suffer a little bit. So I think that in my opinion, that's probably the, the number one thing that, that uh, is uh, important in terms of uh, to develop. And uh, I'm not surprised that um, our participants today uh, have selected that uh, as the number one. No, absolutely. I think, I think the key thing here we're seeing is, uh, of course, going back to the business partnering maturity model and the polling here, you can clearly see where things are moving. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that uh, we should be pushing forward the uh, softer skills a little bit more. But that sits within the business knowledge as well as anything else. So um, thank you very much, Anthony and George, for your comments. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for voting. Uh, just on a side note, please keep sending your, um, your questions via the chat box and you can address it to whichever speaker you would like to ask as well. And we will try and answer them all, um, a few today and of course um, the rest via email. So, let me hide this now and let us move on to our uh, next session, which is uh, on integrated FPNA business partnering. Uh, to talk to us about that, we've got uh, George Colocotrones, who is a divisional FD at Medio. Um, so, George, whenever you're ready, over to you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, thank you, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about my business partnering journey and my experiences and what I feel are uh, some very, very important skills uh, that are necessary to be a successful business partner. So as you'll see on the next slide, uh, success in business partnering can be summarized with the following quote, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence win championships. So that's to say that a solid skill set can promote success towards a, a executing a task. However, not until the organization is actively or cohesively in full alignment can you actually be successful in implementing on the business uh, business plan. And that is where I believe an effective business partner can make all the difference. So starting with the next slide, I would like to share my FP&A business partner journey with you. In my experience uh, in the field of accounting spans for 27 years in various fields, uh, such as uh, financial services, telecommunications, IT consulting, uh, electronic imaging, pharma distribution, and medical devices. The following slide presents the evolution of the types of roles in my career. So during the first half of my career, uh, I worked mostly in traditional accounting roles, uh, among other things, doing month-end accounting, uh, reporting, consolidation. And while these roles provided me with an opportunity to learn about the business, over the years, I kind of re recognized that there was a better and faster way to understand uh, what was going on in the business. And so I wanted to find a way to be more impactful uh, and to generate more value. And I felt a little disconnected at times and I wanted to be closer to where the action was. Um, and that was also uh, well aligned with my emerging needs uh, uh, and uh, someone who was um, a very entrepreneurial spirited and a mindset of having, uh, trying to find ways to create change and improve the organization. So in the latter part of my career, um, I've been engaged in much more of a business partnering role, working closely with individuals that are tasked with assess, uh, assessing the business and making the decisions. And I've closely aligned my objectives with theirs and supported their, their efforts 
to deliver on what I call the holy grail of business objectives, and that's to perpetually improve profitability. So on the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit uh, of what my journey has consisted of. So the reason I was predominantly attracted to a business partnering role was that a business partnering role allowed me to work hand in hand with a diverse set of departments, including sales and procurement, operations, HR, IT, uh, finance, legal. Having that diverse set of business partners allows you to focus, to be forced to, to, to be curious and to address all aspects of the business, and, to, and to, such as uh, what's the efficiency in the day-to-day -day operations? Um, how do I onboard a new customer? Or how do I integrate a, new, a newly acquired business? It prevented me from falling into the trap of taking kind of a narrow, single-minded thought process uh, and allowed me to maintain a broad perspective. It also inspired me to think about the implications that were involved and to ask thought-provoking questions, such as, were the activities being conducted and the decisions being made responding favorably to the business plan? Did the organization have the right mix of talent and resources? Were the scarce organizational resources being effectively used? So searching for answers to these questions and being able to serve my stakeholders by providing valuable, actionable decision support was my number one objective. Second, I made a, a conscious effort to hire strategically. I put a lot of effort into training my team and developing the proper skill set, the, the skill set that our business partners were expecting of us. So finding that right talent for the business partner role requires being people oriented, having a collaborative mind frame, being compassionate and curious with the ability to develop the business acumen that's required. In my opinion, that requires three distinct qualities, an ability to resolve conflict, to be resilient, even in the face of adversity, and the ability to demonstrate agility and flexibility, particularly when everybody else struggles with that. Third, I had to put a lot of effort in understanding the numbers, connecting the cause and effect, and allowing the story to be told. In order to be a trusted business partner, one of the first things that was clear to me was that I needed to have a strong understanding of the business. In order to have a seat at the table, to be listened to, and to have weight behind my comments and recommendations, I needed to know what I was talking about. So first I made sure to build knowledge, of the business by following and understanding the available data, okay? Watching and listening all the time, and then asking a lot of questions. And I also made a concerted effort to break the silos between finance, which had traditionally been a back office function, and the business operations. And over time, this showed my stakeholders of my curious and inquisitive nature, my wanting to learn uh, about the business. Second, to become more influential and well-regarded, especially during times of crisis, I needed to be more resilient, to be able to understand the numbers and paint a picture, to clearly articulate the outcome, and to engage in the respective business language so that I assure my business partners that we are, we are being listened to. And lastly, I knew that I had to leverage one of my greatest strengths, that of my analytical thinking. So I followed the numbers. I made sure that I understood what the numbers were saying, I identified emerging trends, and I created a story to help transition the quantitative to the qualitative. This approach allowed me to bridge the understanding of the business problem across all stakeholders. And I felt that in order to gain engagement across all functional stakeholders, I would have to present a common identifiable idea. And what better way to do that than a story? On the next slide, I'll talk to you about uh, where I am today in my journey. So my journey today has brought me to a young organization in the digital health space. Medio is a growing company, but so far they have done so without a formal FP&A process in place. Since I joined about half a year ago, uh, we have made good progress on establishing a financial business plan, uh, but we're far from being over, uh, being, being done. Uh, and as, as you will see on this slide today, this organization is really at the beginning a stage of its FP&A transformation. So we're going from having no formal budget to uh, implementing our first official uh, enterprise-wide budget. We're working on Excel-based KPI to something more visual-based in, in terms of a dashboard. The business model is transitioning from a simple assumptions-driven plan to one that's centered around drivers. And we're also now beginning to make different assessments on alternative outcomes um, and what those really mean. Finally, our business intelligence capabilities are currently manually driven with limited availability. So where do we want to go from? 
from from now from next we want to go to the future so i'm excited about the possibilities that are open at medio uh, with a very entrepreneurial management team very open-minded to change i see the possibilities in the future once the organization has absorbed uh, the 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 uh, the, um, the planning mindset they've got implemented the necessary technology and they've displayed the required financial discipline i see the possibility of extending the planning function to going to beyond budgeting and i would also like to transition our driver-based planning to something that's more uh, integrated uh, performance management system as well as to morph our fiscal forecast into a rolling forecast given that medio is part of a global technology company I'm also excited about the potential to grow our scenario planning using AI and machine learning. Hopefully you've enjoyed my story and you can relate in some part to my experience. So if this resonates with you, if you've had similar experiences or you're trying to advance in the FP&A spectrum, but have found it challenging, I'd love to hear from you. And hopefully I can come back and present some further developments. Thank you. So George, I'm not sure where Hans is, but I think I'll go ahead and just comment on your uh, portion. So uh, great presentation and uh, really enjoyed what you said. And I think it was great that it was in contrast to uh, what we saw in the last polling question where only 12% of the people thought that uh, being a, having the soft skills was important. And clearly, you know, with your technical know-how, but also having the soft skills, uh, you know, you were able to get a seat at the table and having a seat at the table, obviously, you know, let you, you leverage all the technology and all the changes you made with things such as driver-based planning, move further ahead. So uh, definitely, I mean, you know, obviously there were four choices in the last poll. We definitely should not discount uh, that of uh, the soft skills. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Tom, over to you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I was on mute, of course. So, uh, Tom, over to you. All right, thanks. So, George, yeah, I I, uh, I enjoyed your uh, session. I I had three big takeaways. Um, first, I really loved your opening with the Michael Jordan quote about teamwork, and you made the point about the need for collaboration and alignment. Right, alignment matched up to the strategy of the company as well as with FBNA. So, I thought that was a really good point. Number one. Uh, number two, I like the way you outlined your progression from, you know, kind of to this trusted advisor and to the notion of value partnering. So I thought you really laid out kind of that traditional accounting route and then how you, you know, gathered skills and knowledge and moved up in that, that notion of the value chain. Uh, and then the third point I really liked was your, um, your now to next. I thought that was a really good way of saying here, I'm going to now to next and then from next to the future. So I think you laid out the journey, gave people some really good points there, um, just like you see here on where you think the next part is for the future. And your emphasis on business acumen, like Pras said, this, that soft skill thing, I think is probably more important than many people realize, but um, well done, good stuff. Uh, Anthony, you were meant to comment as well, if you would like to join us and, and give us your uh, insight, please. Um, of course. Uh you know, George, I think that your story is really great. And, you know, thank you for sharing that. And and for, you know, uh, it's something that all of us can probably relate to in one way or another. Um, but I think your your story really captured the essence of what it is to be a business partner. Um, it's continuous learning, being curious, um, having the right, you know, team around you. Um, and, and it's all about building trust with the business. And I think, you know, that's, that was uh, definitely uh, underscored in your your presentation um, and obviously helped uh, you achieve a lot in in your journey. So thank you for sharing. Pras, Anthony, uh, and Tom, thank you very much for your comments. And and George, thank you for a great presentation and for it for sharing that journey with us. Uh, let us now move on to our next polling question and hear from our uh, members on to um, where. Would you say your organization is on that integrated FPNA business partnering journey? Is it still very much um, central FPNA, central FPNA business partnering, or is it an integrated model all the way through the organization? So, first option there, yes, we run an integrated FPNA business partnering model, which is cross organization. 
Uh, we do plan to implement such a structure in the near future, so we don't run it now. Uh, we don't run it now, and there's no plans for uh, any such model in the future. If you would like to vote, please, uh, uh, that would be great. So first option, yes, we do run integrated FPNA business partnering. Secondly, we do not at the moment, but plan to implement shortly. And thirdly, there's no plan to implement it. So uh, I am now going to close the vote and um, share the results with everyone. So 37, 34% said we run an integrated FPNA business partnering. 48% we are planning to do so. And 18% we are not going to implement uh, anything similar. If I can ask George and Pras to join me and give us some insight into these comments, please. So, George, if I can start with you, please. Yeah, I think the results are a little bittersweet in the sense that uh, I'm actually surprised that one in five have no plans to uh, go to a, uh, an integrated FP&A uh, business partnering model. Um, but on the sweet spot, that definitely gives a lot of room for improvement. Um, I think uh, as FP&A transformation continues to evolve, and uh, the messaging uh, is broadcast, uh, more and more folks will realize that uh, the importance uh, of getting onto this transformation and, and putting this across the whole organization. Uh, and I, I, would, uh, I would beg to, uh, to differ that those results would probably go down. I would expect at least everybody to be in uh, some sort of uh, integration process or, or uh, you know, uh, beginning one. Thank you. And Prask, your comment, please. Yeah, I concur with what George was saying. I mean, I'm a little surprised with the 18%, but again, there's always room for improvement. And, um, you know, what I would say, I mean, and there's always many reasons, whether it's corporate support, top-down, you know, leadership uh, views on FP&A and their strategic value, some of which, which I'll cover in my session going forward. But, you know, I expect that that number 18%, as we revisit it over time, it will hopefully start to drop and we'll see a greater increase in uh, those that have implemented such a structure and those that are about to. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think uh, uh, during the pandemic, we've seen the importance of having an integrated structure, which is where that 48% must push very, very quickly into the 34%. Uh, the 18%, as you high, uh, highlighted, Price, of course, there's lots of various reasons. One of the other reasons could be that, you know, the size of the company, the resources available, etc. But very definitely, we have to get onto that bandwagon and that journey very, very shortly. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Pras and George, for your comments. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for voting as well. I will hide um, the results and we will now move on to our next session, which is on technology to build FP&A business partnering. And um, to deliver that, we've got Pras Chatterty, who is Senior Director at SAP. Pras, over to you. Whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Hans. And uh, thank you, everyone, for giving me this chance to speak to you about how technology can help uh, uh, let everyone uh, become a better business partner. So as we move on, um, one of the things I wanted to discuss was uh, the results of our survey. So uh, many of you participated in the uh, 2021 FP&A Trends Survey that was released in January, and the results are being consolidated right now. Uh, but I work with Hans, uh, uh, Larissa, and the team to get an early preview, especially in the area of business partnering, since that is uh, important to today's discussion. And some of the challenges that I saw that came out were that only 17% of organizations complete their forecast in two days or less. We're not talking about budgets here. We're talking about just a simple forecast uh, in its absolute simplicity, which really, on the flip side, highlights the fact that 83% of organizations are completing it in, um, you know, greater than two days so when we think about our business partners that come to us and say or business constituents and ask us a question on a uh, some sort of scenario or something that's happened especially during the pandemic and only 17 percent can do it in two days uh it is somewhat frightening so this is something challenging as well the other part is that and this number has gotten better but it's still not a great area 20 percent and eight percent of organizations say that fpna is not deemed a strategic investment area and McKinsey had a great article during the pandemic last June or so, where they basically said that out of the different groups in finance, FP&A was the, especially with the best in class organizations, FP&A is considered the most strategic investment area. So there's, again, this improvement that we've gone down to 28%, there's still a long ways to go. And the other part is that um, there's been an increase up to 16% in terms of the percentage of time driving action. So again, we need to spend more time 
driving actions. Uh, we've increased it by 10% to 16%. Uh, but again, I expect to see this grow. But in order to see all this fulfilled and become a stronger and better business partner, and to have the technology to support this, three key things for, in my opinion, scenario planning, predictive planning, and finally, extended planning analysis. So let's move over to scenario planning. So Shu talked earlier about the importance of scenario planning, and she talked about uh, you know, mini CFOs and such, and I'm gonna get to that in a bit, but in terms of scenario planning, it's absolutely important. I mean, if we think about the pandemic, the old way of doing budgets and forecasts, a scheduled forecast or a scheduled budget, a budget that you started in August because someone did a strap plan earlier, they gave you top-down targets, you filtered those top-down targets, you did some sort of reconciliation with the different lines of businesses, tried to make sure people didn't sandbag, you worked on that budget between you know, September and December, and then you finished it in January sometime. That is absolutely obsolete, and there's no value to that, especially when we think about uh, things such as beyond budgeting, which George talked about him uh, aspiring to do as well. The, the beauty of scenario planning in this day and age is being able to run simulations. At the height of the pandemic, what McKinsey pointed out and what many of you faced was people coming to you as FP&A saying, what is the impact of our disruption in our supply chain? What is the impact of uh, furloughing our employees? Or what is the impact of working from home? What is the impact of X, Y, and Z? Not in silos, but in unison as well, or in different permutations and combinations. If you weren't able to provide that through scenario planning um, and the ability to create scenarios immediately and on the fly, you weren't being a good business partner to your business constituents. As well, I talked about moving away from scheduled plans and really thinking ahead versus looking back. That is absolutely key, as well as being proactive. Moving away from scheduled plans means that as FP&A, as planners, you're thinking outside the box, you're looking ahead, you're looking at commodity prices, the disruption of supply chains, potential inflation happening here, uh, the um, evolution of cryptocurrency or whatnot, all these different things that may or may not impact your business or present you with opportunities and being all proactive in terms of planning with scenarios to give you a better idea of what's about to happen. Now, if we move on next to predictive planning, and really the beauty of predictive planning is that it is not a scary technology anymore. All modern best-in-class FP&A solutions in the cloud have machine learning and AI and um, predictive planning built directly into it. Now, I've often ha have people say to me, oh, well, we don't have the budget to come up with a data scientist or whatnot. You know, Larissa, Hans, and FP&A uh, Trends have often talked about having skills in this area. But, you know, you don't really need to be an expert in this. These tools exist in modern budgeting and forecasting solutions, which means that with this, you can um, add predictive scenarios to your scenario planning to combine your human intelligence with artificial intelligence and machine learning to basically say that, hey, this is the data set that I want to work with. These are some of the human intelligence I'm putting in based on my expectations. And let's see what's generated. Now, it might not always be the right answer, but it's an answer that'll let you uncover hidden insights. Because again, not everything is available to you at all times. I mean, the human eye or the naked eye only has so much uh, perception available to it. But uncovering these human, uh, these hidden insights will effectively allow you to challenge different areas, uh, challenge norms, look at things that, again, might not have been visible to you. And the beauty of all this is with scenario planning and easy to use predictive planning, which is available at the click of a button, you can simulate so many potential future outcomes, best in class, worst in class, upsides, downsides. And with all of this, come to a conclusion that again, you can share with your business constituents. Because the worst thing that can happen is not only when your business constituents come to you with a scenario, with a forecast, with a potential outcome that they're looking for, and you say, give me two days, give me more than two days, which 83% of you might be doing, um, the whole, I'll get back to you, it doesn't work in today's day and age. FP&A needs to be proactive and come up and come ahead with all these insights. So what brings us all together with the next slide is effectively the whole process of XPNA, extended planning and analysis. Um, Shu talked earlier about mini CFOs, and the idea, reality is that everybody plans in the organization. Planners exist in sales, in marketing, in IT, in supply chain, in HR. Every group here has a mini CFO. They might not be called a CFO. They might be called a finance manager, a finance director of sales, or whatnot. But if we think about it, about it all these groups need to be aligned. Uh, marketing, for example, runs campaigns, and these campaigns have targets. But where do these get these? Why do they run these campaigns, and why do they have targets? Well, they have to work with sales, so they need access to what sales is projecting in terms of. Uh, 
volume that they've committed to or sales that they're committing to or pipeline that they're, uh, they've generated. And then supply chain, for example, needs to be able to understand what sales is forecasting so they can have the right resources and commodities um, in order to build the goods and you know, keep up with the potential demand. HR needs to potentially look at this to see that, do they have the people on board right now, the people coming to you know, the table later on to be able to support all these endeavors? And does IT have the appropriate capital infrastructure with regards to computers or whatnot to support everybody's initiatives? The reality is that everybody's planning and where finance sits is effectively in the middle, quarterbacking the whole initiative through modern cloud-based planning technology where they can bring all of these uh, solution, all of these siloed groups in, in one area and effectively lead the process for finance. Because ultimately the beauty of all this is that when everybody's planning together, the organization moves and thinks as one, finance is able to be a much better business partner because they've got a pulse into what's happening in every facet of the organization. They can lead everyone, hold their hands and ultimately work together to make faster and more confident decisions for everyone and ultimately increase shareholder value and increase the organization's space in the marketplace. Thank you, Pras. Great example of what are the technologies available out there um, and you know how we can move using those technology, you know, the business partnering element into this digitized age and you know move that 16% percentage that you shared earlier from FBNA Trends Survey a lot more into insight prov uh, provision etc so thank you very much for that can i ask tom and shu to join us and give us some uh, comments on uh, process presentation please so uh, shu if i can start with you please yeah so uh, one thing i appreciate in pras presentation is um you know the strategic alignments within all departments and the collaboration you know, um, I think regarding the strategic alignment, you know, in my humble opinion, that the key milestone for FPNA career progression is if we can think of a big picture and strategically. And this is pretty aligned with what I described describe up front, like the mini CFO mindset, right? The how closer we're getting to the CFO, which is how we can make the career progression on that. And also the collaboration is really not between the finance and business, but also between the, all the finance members who support, you know, various business to ensure the alignment here. You know, when we talk about the team, you know, we talk about the FNA team, which is a subset of the finance team. And but you think about that, we cannot live very well without the support from our accounting team, which is also part of the finance team. And we really couldn't live very well without the support from the business. So overall, you know, it's all team culture. It's a, you know, collaboration. It's all one team, either within FNA or entire finance, or you can think about the entire GNA or entire company. It's all one team and collaboration. So this is my biggest takeaway from Pras presentation. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Um, Tom, can I come to you, please? Yes, uh, Pras, loved your uh, session. I, I, I saw a couple things. I, the, the start out with the survey, 28% had not moved into that strategic realm. So I'd say, wow, we still have work to do. And I think the earlier survey, on this session kind of validated that. Um, the other one is driving action. We like to say insights turned into action, right? Or is the critical thing we do. You, you said we move from 10% to 16%. So again, we need to keep doubling down on getting that moving. The other comment you had, which I, I liked a lot, was the notion that in order for us to move into this value partner, we have to be proactive. And we like to say we have to move from the rear view mirror view to the windshield view. And I think that's what we're all trying to do. Certainly the pandemic has forced that on us even more than ever. And then finally, your your uh, your last slide, this whole um, X FPNA or the extended and cross-functional. I mean, I think that's where we need to get, right? Woven throughout the business in marketing, in sales, supply chain, et cetera, and helping them drive that business. I think that's been a common theme from everyone on this panel today. So. Uh, I would say good work and um, some great insights there. Thank you very much, uh, Tom and Shu, for your comments. And uh, Pras, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, now that you've set the scene on XPNA, which is extended planning and analysis, let us hear from our uh, attendees today, our FPNA board members, as to where they think their organization is on that journey. Um, so what is the most effective process for unlocking extended planning and analysis opportunity in your organization? Uh, if you can vote, please, uh, 
is it a flexible FPNA system? Is it an effective FPNA business partnering? Is it integrated processes? Or D, is it predictive and prescriptive analytics, AI, ML, so a lot around technology? So if you can vote, please, A, flexible FPNA system, effective FPNA business partnering, integrated FPNA business uh, processes, predictive, prescriptive analytics, AI, and ML. Uh, we've got 70% voted already, so I'm now going to close the session and share the results. Um, and the results is showing us 16% is around flexible FBNA system, 30% business partnering, 36% around processes, uh, and finally 18% around predictive and prescriptive uh, analytics. If I can ask um, Pras and Tom to join us, please, and give us some comments on this. So if I may start with you, Pras. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the results don't surprise me, and they do make sense. I mean, ultimately, I mean, the flexible FPNA system is the easy part. I mean, do your research, get a best-in-class solution, and that's done. But it's really the integrated FPNA process. Uh, explain the value of integrated FPNA and an XPNA process to everyone across the organization, and getting them to buy in in terms of why this is important. Maybe changing some of their norms and processes for a best-in-class process. You know, that goes beyond helping me to helping we. I think that's probably the most important thing. Thank you very much. And Tom, your insight, please. I'm going to echo Prost there a bit, but um, it looks like you're actually showing that progression. And obviously, the, the place we're all trying to get to is that predictive and prescriptive uh, analytics driven by AI. One of the things I'm thinking about is we have to start thinking about AI and IA, meaning artificial intelligence and uh, integrated intelligent right we got to have intelligence augmented which would be the human side of this so i think as we all learn these processes we have to start understanding what tech can do and then beginning to use that to get to that notion of the predictive and prescriptive so i think this kind of shows that journey if you will uh, spot on both of you there thank you very much for your comments uh, uh if i may now hide this uh and ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for voting as well uh, also, a quick reminder, please keep sending your uh, questions. We've got some great questions for the panels here. We will attempt to answer all of them uh, via email, definitely, for those that we can't answer today. So let me hide this now and let us move on with our presentation. Um, our last presentation is Getting Future Ready for Digitized FBNA Business Partnering. Uh, mindset required, which is very, very important. And to deliver that, we've got Tom. So Tom, welcome back, and uh, over to you whenever you're ready, Tom. Thank you, Hans. Let's uh, let's move right to this next uh, slide because I think um, a couple things. You know, woven through everyone's presentations has been this idea of skill sets, and we found that uh, as well as tool sets. You know, we just finished with uh, Pros talking about the tools and technologies that can help us move to this uh, uh, extended FP&A business partnering. So. Um, but I like this quote from Mike Walsh of Futures, and he says, if you automate, you must elevate the skills of your team. Now, we've been researching this for quite a while, and I want to talk about three things because we've learned that it takes the tools, but mindset is one that's often overlooked. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. And then the right skill sets is the most critical. And I'm going to share our latest research and some of the insights we've been getting from talking with um, CFOs all over the world. So let's go to that next slide. This is uh, the Hackett Group's most recent research and two big insights that validated everything we kept hearing in the market. So first is they did their top 10 key issues for finance organizations. And for the first time in the history of this survey, which I think goes back at least 10 years, skills showed up. It was never on the top issues. And this time it showed up as aligning skills and talent with the changing business needs. I want, want to note the changing business needs because what you're hearing from everyone today is that all the changes in the businesses around FBNA are accelerating. And so what does that mean about your teams? I think what it means is we have to accelerate their skills from that perspective in order to be successful and meet those um, extended FBNA goals. The other thing was what's getting in the way of transformation progress? And you know the usual suspect, technology and process. I mean, obviously, every day there's new technologies that we have to think about. 
But look at number two and number three. Um, reinforcement of those same concepts, right? Finance staff lack or deficiency of critical skills, and then organizational resistance to change. And that's the first time um, that these things started to show up in that uh, one, two, and three spot. All right, next slide can, is kind of more confirmation. This We did this research with KPMG a while back, and look at what showed up, right? The biggest barriers or the biggest critical success factors, rather, for finance transformation is motivation of the workforce to embrace change and a growth mindset. 39% is about that. Now, I didn't circle it, but I probably should have. Skip a bar where it says strong leadership and look at teamwork, collaborative working culture and workforce soft skills, another 24%. So if you take that 24 and that 39, right, you're up to 63% of this whole transformation gets to mindset and skill set and then throw in strong leadership and now you're basically have the formula for a successful finance transformation. So let me show you what kind of skills, that's the next slide, where we really talk, kind of did a lot of research on this idea of a T-shaped professional. That means broad boundary crossing skills across the top, on top of your deep technical, you know, financial, analytical, it could be the accounting part of that, uh, might be the tax team, all those. That's the deep technical expertise that we have kind of table stakes. So what we've learned is those skills on the top are, go are going to be what allow you to cross all those different departments, divisions, and bringing that you know, business together, if you will, from a strategic standpoint. So I think you can see that in this notion, looking at that little circle, right? Technical skills, business skills. So three quarters of that are not technical skills. We call them success skills from that perspective. So that's what we're seeing that the need is. And the final slide goes deeper into all of those categories. So that's one of the things we've been building is a curriculum that you can go all the way up and get a CGMA certification, or you can pick the right skills. We would say select the top three or four buckets and get your people skilled up in the areas that you need the most. Because I think a couple of people have already talked about the idea that it takes a team and strengths come from different players. So you can create a curriculum that would supplement the right people with the right skills. So tool sets, you gotta have the right tools. That's kind of the you know table stakes to get this technology moving, but make sure you've got the right mindset and the right skill set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, great stats in the beginning, of course, very uh, mind provoking, thought provoking, which is uh, uh, understandable. And uh, the whole thing around culture, change management, mindset, skill set, et cetera, very, very important indeed. Uh, let us get some insight from Pras as well. So Pras, if you can join us uh, and give us some insight, please, on Tom's presentation, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So a great uh, presentation, Tom, very insightful. And obviously, I'll never be able to repeat everything you said as well as you did. But I mean, the key things that came up to me were, um, obviously, I, I think we still need to go back to leadership and people skills. I'm glad you pointed that out, because it's not just about understanding the technical skills, because in order to adopt you know, big changes like XPNA, business transformation, finance transformation, and you know, becoming a better business partner. You need to be able to lead, and in order to lead, you need the people skills to be able to build the relationships and really navigate across the aisle or whatnot. Uh, the other part of it is digital finance. I think that's extremely important. I mean, I come across organizations often where a lot of the finance people I often come across, uh, they're you know well trained uh, through their accounting studies or you know many times MBA studies at interpreting income statement, the balance sheet, or cash flow. But it's going beyond that. Looking at a data warehouse and the analytics on top of that, being able to pull data, interpret those results, and I think. Going back to what um, Anthony or George had both said, and I think Shu had said as well, being able to tell a story behind that. So, and again, that ties into your leadership and people skills. Um, you know, again, taking all that modern information in there, not just finance data, but the operational and finance, marrying it together and making sense of it um, and present that in a leadership uh, 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 process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment there, Pras. And, and Tom, thank you for a, a fantastic presentation. Um, it is now a great time to go on to key takeaways. So I will ask uh, the remaining uh, members of the uh, panel to join us uh, where, whilst we go through um, what are the key conclusions from each of uh, your presentations. 
Um, Shu, if I may start uh, with yourself. So one quick takeaway from you, please. Um, my biggest takeaway is that, you know, we, we get we get together here and we share and learn from each other the past to get to the leading stage. Actually, you know, Han just talked about in the beginning of the session, you know, the skill set, the process, the technology, the strong team, all we needed to help transform and scale the business. So overall, I think it's a great learning for me and I enjoyed the discussion. I hope everyone here has enjoyed it as well. Thank you, Shu. Anthony? Great. Um, so for in terms of maturing your model, I think the most important thing is the mindset and you know not assuming that it's going to happen overnight, um, but that it's a constant evolution. And as long as you're kind of pushing for that change and constantly evolving, um, you'll you'll be maturing your model. Thank you very much. Uh, George, your key takeaway, please. Well, if you look at the presentations we saw today combined, they, they paint a very clear picture for me. So in order to be successful, uh, the FP&A transformation that's currently in effect today across finance requires a few key necessary events. First is you need to have the proper, the proper skill set development. Second, it has to be an integrated enterprise-wide approach. So Anthony talked about the one plan. Third, that Pras mentioned so nicely, it has to be supported by the right technology and the evolution in technology. And then fourth, it has to be wrapped around the proper mindset, a mindset that's change ready. So that was my key takeaway. Thank you. Pras, your key takeaway, please. Yeah, I think the key takeaway here is people often listen to someone like a technologist like myself and they think that will prove it to me or show me. And hearing from Anthony, Shu, and George, you heard about three different cases of organizations where they have led, they've worked, and they're actually where you know most foreign uh, FPA organizations absolutely need to be, where they have become business partners, where they're telling a better story, where they're reaching across the aisle and actually leading across. Uh, so again, this isn't, you know, people often say, well, the grass isn't greener across the other side. Well, in this case, the grass is greener. And I think that is a key takeaway. Thank you. And finally, Tom, your key takeaway, please. Yeah, Hans, I think what I learned from um, being part of this is that it, it in fact is a journey. I mean, I, I think, you know, Anthony, Shu, and George all laid out kind of how they did it. Not, not any of them did it the exact same way. So I think there's a there's hope there for all of us out there to say we can actually find our way through this. I think a lot of the key concepts you heard about tool set, right, the right technologies, mindset making sure your people are change ready and and you can lead them through that journey and then skill set are you building the skills for the future that you might need but but all in all you've got to kind of pick the journey and and i think you've got lots of learnings like think about this like a playbook is how i thought about it and uh, i thought it would really came together well so i'm i'm honored to be here with this group of folks Absolutely spot on, uh, Tom. You know, it is a journey and you know where you are in that journey. But the key thing is, how do you move forward? And we've seen three case studies and we've seen uh, from Pras as well. What are the technologies available out there? And of course, uh, from your end, Tom, the skill sets, the mindset change, uh, the different types of skills required to move to that journey. So thank you very much, guys, for that. It is now a good time for our Q&A session. So, um, and we will start in the same sort of order. The first question goes to Shu. Shu, thank you for sharing with us the old way of working and the new way of working that you are implementing in uh, CA. Um, what do you believe were the different skill set that were required um, from an angle of, you know, the new way? What, what changes were required in terms of skill set? Um, I think in my humble opinion, so two things are the key things, key foundations for success in a new way. Number one is the ability to deep dive in the business and partnering with the business. Um, and number two is, you know, the softer skill, which is not, you know, like the, you know, take some Excel and build some models, but instead of like how we can explain the models, how we can tell the story from the numbers to the business and make an impact. Um, so that would be my two things that I feel like if you want to move on to the new change, these are the two key things to learn and to um, to make success. Thank you very much, Shu. Thank you for that. Uh, if we go to um, Anthony now. Anthony, a, a very interesting question for you. Of course, you talked about the three pillars. Um, 
do your teams move around these three areas to ensure personal development aims are achieved or anything you would like to um, add to that as well? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And that is also a key driver in why we, you know, use these pillars as a way to frame uh, the work that our teams are doing and, and organizing the work that our teams are doing. Um, I think it comes back to the consideration of skill set, um, making sure that those skill sets that your team either wants to work on or, you know, is showing up with and, and wants to really lean into. Um, this helps us align them into one of those pillars um, so that not only will they be very successful both in the short term and in you know their long-term career uh, development um, but the team overall will be successful in that way by, by matching the skill sets um, so yes it does create a mechanism to kind of create uh, uh, you know development from a career perspective um, and also just you know overall success at the individual and the team level so um, so yeah I think I think that's a really great question. It's a great way of upskilling, uh, you know, um, and cross training at the same time each member of the team, as well as you know giving them insight in in the all three different pillars. So so thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Anthony. And we now go to um, George. Uh, George, a very interesting question. Of course, you've described you know uh, where you are now, where you want to be, and then towards the end, what is that vision look like? You know. What is the ideal? What is that leading stage, so to say? Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about the timeline for each of these uh, three different stages, please? Sure. Thank you for that question. So, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are uh, going to be implementing our first budget process. So that'll be um, in effect uh, later this year. So. Um, with that budget process, uh, we'll start to uh, kind of uh, look at the ready, uh, um, the readiness of the organization to, to take the next steps. Um, this is a, a journey. Uh, this is not something uh, that uh, I'm planning to set a very short target. Uh, I think it's important to go through the journey and do it right. Um, there's a certain uh, a change, a readiness that the organization needs to be uh, accepting towards. Um, there's a discipline in finance and numbers that needs to be accepted. Uh, and, um, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of work that's going to be required from the organization because uh, we are talking about business partnering and we're talking about an integrated approach. And so um, some of that some of that effort is going to come uh, from other departments in the organization. So as I kind of deem, uh, you know, the readiness uh, um, with the organization, I'll start to push forward. Uh, ideally, I, I would like to be completed with my next phase um, within 12 to 18 months. Uh, and then be looking to the the future uh, after that. Thank you very much for for that, George. I, I think very important as well. Uh, it, it is a journey, and as you well described it, and it's very important for um, each organisation to assess where they are, where they want to go next. Also, look at quick impacts as well, quick wins. You know, what are the quick wins? You know, that you could achieve very very quickly. But at the same time, not forgetting what that long-term plan is as well. You know, stick to that, but look at the quick wins that you can bring in. So thank you very much for that, George. Uh, Pras, before we come to you, uh, just a quick reminder, ladies and gentlemen, please keep sending your uh, questions. The ones we can't answer uh, here on the platform, we will answer via email. So please uh, keep sending them. Uh, very interesting question for you, Pras. Of course, a lot of organizations are still struggling with Excel, have an ERP system, but they don't know where to go. So the question is around, you know, um, of course, you've listed out the technologies, the tools available to help transform FPNA into XPNA. But the question was, in, in, in other words, where do you go beyond your accounting system in Excel? What is next? How do you take that step and the leap into these technologies? If you can just highlight, please, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, the key thing here is finance transformation. I mean, if you're going to go towards this technology, I mean, it's about outlining a brand new process as well so that you can better solve your, serve yourselves as well as your business constituents. Uh, you know, I think Gartner talks about the fact that, you know, they predict by 2024, 60% uh, of organizations uh, will look at it as an overwhelming finance suite. You know, your ERP and planning system and consolidations are all integrated in one because, you know, we talked today about making better and quicker and faster decisions and, you know, getting away from the I'll get back to you, getting away from the two-day-to-process. So you wanted to 
co-joined system where everything is fully integrated. And uh, that's where having a maybe a you know a common you know whatever ERP solution you're using right now, uh, see if that vendor has a planning solution that works together. So that you know as your transactions are hitting, your actuals are coming in on a second by second basis, you're able to do an actuals to plan variance comparison right now versus waiting and telling your business constituents, I'll get back to you or give me a few days. So the idea is then, you know, look at the tools you have and see what you can make go faster. And the beauty of modern finance technology is it's not like the old days where you needed an army of consultants sitting there and deploying things. They're like Everybody's got best practices, content, and packages that really make these uh, deployments, whether it's ERP or planning uh, solutions, you know, happen in weeks versus years. So, I mean, it's not like it, it's, it's not yesterday's finance suite. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that process. Very, very important that planning tool that links with your ERP system. And then, you know, as you mentioned, more and more planning tools have got all of these new technologies uh, embedded in them. And after the Gartner um, uh, survey that came out last year, more and more um, uh, solution providers are working on all of these tools. So all of the stuff that um, process talked about are already embedded. So very easy to put into practice. Thank you very much for that, Pras. Uh, final question then, um, of course, goes to Tom. Uh, Tom, you talked about changing mindset, which is one of the key issues highlighted in those um, stats that we saw. Um, how would you go about tackling the, the change in culture, the change in mindset? Any any steps you would like to highlight, please? Yeah, I think I think one is to to make sure that your team understands the environment. I think it's the understanding those external trends, which a lot of them deal with technology and especially the exponential rate of technology change. And when they understand that that is almost inevitable, then you start to charge them with what are the opportunities that we see. So if you can put a positive how you're thinking about the journey and that you're looking at a positive future, we call it a future view, then they will start to, you know, if they have some trust in you, which many say they do, uh, then they're going to say, okay, I know you're looking out for our future and I'm willing to go on this journey. But what they keep telling us is they feel like they're bobbing around in the ocean with these waves of change washing over them. And what they want is they want you to chart their course out. I think one of the things you need to do is say, we can't stop these waves, but we can learn how to surf. And that's where I think if you give them a constructive way that you're going to upskill them, reskill them and involve them in that future change, then we say it makes a point. Like one of the common sayings we like comes from a futurist who says, um, how you think about the future affects your actions today and your actions today affect your future. In other words, your future view is the future you. So I think that's what we have to take in mind as we plan how they're gonna do that. Love the way you talked about the wave and surfing the wave together, absolutely uh, are crucial. I think if you don't take people on that journey, then you know it is a route for failure. But also taking, um, of course, you have a lot of leaders, you have a lot of middle managers that will buy into the whole process and a few that won't. So I think it, the key thing is, for them to help the others understand what that journey is and bring them along on that wave as well. So thank you very much, Tom and, and panelists. Thank you very much for answering the question. We've got a few, we will answer them all via email. Uh, so keep sending your uh, questions as well. Uh, guys, you can stay on the webcam. I've got a few um, uh, slides to go through, which is closing slides. And then we will say goodbye to our uh, great uh, attendees today. So what's next? We've got FPNA Trends webinar, um, latest trends and development in financial planning, the 2021 global survey results, the one that Pras was talking about, uh, I mentioned as well on the 6th of July. Guys, great insight coming from there. So very important. The link is there, so if you click it, you can join as well. And the next one is the myth and conception of rolling forecast and FPNA scenario planning, June 24th. So book those in your diary. A uh, great time to now say thank you to our uh, sponsors today. So today we've had SAP sponsoring us and the Business Learning Institute on behalf of FPNA Trends. Guys, thank you very much. Without you guys, it wouldn't have been possible. But also, panelists, thank you very much for your insight. It was great presentation, great insight, 
and great commentaries and interaction between uh, all of you. So thank you very much. Um, and of course, thank you to all the uh, FPNA board and the attendees today for making time. I hope the session has been uh, helpful for you guys. This is how you can connect with us um, via uh, our website, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, etc. Please stay connected. Uh, this does bring us to the end of our webinar today. I would like to thank you again very much for joining. Uh, remember, when I close this, you will have uh, the feedback session. So please give us your feedback uh, once we close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, right. everyone.